And for that time of worship, Zachary, you might have noticed that I was in the choir this morning. Peter and uh, Lorraine did a great job leading the choir this morning. Uh, first time I've ever been in a choir. I don't usually get nervous, but uh, I was nervous this morning. I uh, guess because I didn't want to mess anything up and I didn't want to let the team down and also because I could feel Peter's steely gaze <laughs> on me during practice uh, anytime I hit a wrong note and that is a truly intimidating experience. Well, the Christmas decorations around here look beautiful. Donna Sharple says her friend Lori did a lot of that. There, there are even Christmas trees in the washroom. Have you noticed that? Never seen that before. So Donna, thank you for all of that hard work and if you would pass on. Yeah, that's appropriate. And uh, while we're on this theme, Conrad um, was the bookkeeper here for nearly 40 years. He signed my first check when I came here and has continued doing that up until sometime in the last year or two. And in the last 19 years, he has not missed one of my checks. And I've always been grateful for that. And then he trained Scott uh, a couple of years ago to sign his name to my check. And he hasn't missed that either. And I've really appreciated that too. Conrad was the treasurer here during all of that time. Uh, Conrad has kept the board straight on all things financial, told us what we could and couldn't do, told us what was legal and what was not legal. It's a good job he told us that. <laughs> told us what we could spend money on, what we couldn't spend money on, how much we could spend. You cannot put a value on the, a price on the value of a fella like that, who protects the church, protects the church's charitable status from financial harm. And I've always had tremendous appreciation for Conrad's presence at board meetings, business meetings, and his giftedness and his financial background in banking. So as I've said over the last couple of years, he's been passing that torch to Scott at the same time as he was caring for Isla right up until she was promoted to heaven just a few months ago and uh, Conrad has had a file uh, out in the back office that we drop receipts in and then uh, every week on a regular basis Conrad would go back there and pick up what we drop off kind of like a drop box so so last week, I thought it was time to retire his file. So here it is, with his name on it. So Conrad, we are officially retiring your file today. Nobody will be allowed to use this file ever again. And we're presenting it to you as a wee memento. And we wrote on it, Conrad, we love you. We appreciate so much your gifted, faithful, strong, steady hand, steering our finances through the seas of ministry these many decades. Do you like that? <laughs> we have no debt because of you, but we are in your debt always. Thank you, Roy, on behalf of the board. Would you stand and give him a round of applause? Thanks for doing that. And now, Conrad, would you come up and do the sermon for me? <laughs> uh, we are in a Christmas series called The Four Big Questions of Christmas. And today we're going to ask and answer the question, at least in whatever time I have left, what does Christmas mean? Some people would say, well, it's a very pretty time of the year. Millennia Trump let the cameras into the White House last week and 
And the White House is decorated like a winter wonderland. It's beautiful. And then some people drill down a bit deeper and say Christmas is a time of hope and joy and love and peace. And all of those are biblical words and biblical messages. And then some people say Christmas is Jesus' birthday. Although most people understand that Jesus was not actually born on December 25th. You understand that. Early Christians took a pagan holiday that centered around the winter solstice, which is December 21st, the shortest day of the year, and Christianized that pagan holiday season. And then others would say Christmas is when God came near in the form of a human baby growing in the womb of a virgin, God in a physical body, Jesus, the God-man. But that begs the question, then, why was Jesus born? What does Christmas mean? Well, that verse I read during communion, Matthew 1, 21, says this, Mary will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for, that's a causal clause, means because, for the reason for, that answers the why question of Christmas, for he will save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus was born, to be a savior. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that is a very offensive statement in our culture for a couple of reasons. One, it infers that everybody sins. And second, it infers that everybody needs a savior. He will save his people from their sins. Now, people don't like to be told they're sinners and don't like to be told they need a savior because it sounds nasty and it sounds needy. Lots of people believe that heaven is real, but lots of people think that they can get there on their own without anybody's help just because they're a good person. They're better than a lot of other people they know. Like the guy sinking in that Irish bog I mentioned to you, saying, I'm not in trouble and I don't need a savior. He will save his people from their sins, the Bible says. Now, what does that mean? Well, take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 2. And I'm going to take you to a non-Christmas passage for the rest of our time, but I need to use this passage to explain what Christmas means. Chapter 2 of 1 John Verse 1 says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you. 1 John is near the end of the Bible, by the way, just in case you need a little bit of help there. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate. That's good news. We have an advocate. We have a lawyer. That's what the word means. A defense lawyer, actually. We have an attorney, John is telling us. We had a young man in our church who got arrested. My other church, so there's no point in you trying to figure out who it is. <laughs> he was 16 years old, and he bought himself a car, and he was fixing it up in his dad's garage. And one day after school, he took a couple of plates off his dad's wall in his garage, and he slapped them onto his car, and he took the car out for a spin right past a police car. And he got nervous, and he looked suspicious because he stared right at the cop as the cop was passing. And the cop spun around, and he pulled him over. And he got himself booked for no license, no insurance, no ownership, no valid plates, underage, and driving an unfit car, and he got himself arrested. First thing his dad said was, you're going to need a lawyer. According to John here, you already have a lawyer. We have an advocate. Now, this is obviously courtroom language. In fact, John is using courtroom language throughout the five chapters of this little letter. John's book is actually a courtroom drama. The word testimony, for example, is one of the key words throughout the entire book. First John chapter 1, for example, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify to it. If you go to the last chapter, John, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the testimony. <coughs> he uses the word eyewitness in chapter 1 as well. So there's courtroom language all through John's little letter. So let's talk about the layout of a courtroom. 
that John's talking about here. First, John identifies the accused. Every trial has an accused. You can't have a trial until an accused has been targeted, arrested, and formally charged. Right at the beginning of a trial, the judge will tell the accused to stand and state his name for the record, and the charges are read, and he enters a plea, guilty or not guilty, which, by the way, is not the same as guilty or innocent. So who is the accused here? Well, look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, very tender word, I am writing these things to you. So the accused are Christians followers of Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. That's Christians, followers of Jesus. Now, an innocent client being found guilty in a, is a lawyer's worst nightmare. It is the worst kind of failure. But there are no innocent, wrongfully accused people in God's divine courtroom. Chapter 1, verse 8 says that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. So if we think we're innocent in God's courtroom, number one, we're delusional, John says. Secondly, we assault the very character of God. Well, so much for the accused. Now let's talk about the charges. There is a very important feature of any courtroom, the charges. The charges against an accused are read out in open court. It's actually quite embarrassing. I was in court with a guy a few years ago, and... He had not told me all of the details of his nefarious activities. And I was shocked when all of the charges were read out in open court for the media to report and for the entire world to hear. And for the purposes of that hearing, the charges also included past charges that he had already been convicted of. And the list was the length that was the length of pages long. It was a truly shaming event. But here's the charges. Chapter 2, verse 1. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate, a lawyer, a defense lawyer, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation of for our sins. We'll come back to that word in just a moment. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Five times the word sin is used or inferred right there. Those are the charges. Sin. Well, that begs a question. What is sin? I told you earlier that it, sin is a relative term. It only has meaning in relation to the holiness of God. Sin in the Greek means it is harmatia, which means to miss the mark. It's like an arrow shot from a bow that falls short of the target. Well, what's the target? What's the mark? What's the, the bullseye that this arrow falls short of? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God's glory is the bullseye. God's glory, God's holiness, God's standard, God's perfection is the bullseye. More practically, God's glory is the Ten Commandments. Don't tell lies. Don't hate people. Don't hurt anybody ever. Don't steal stuff. Don't be jealous of other people's stuff. Ever Don't have a wayward sexual thought ever. Honor your parents perfectly. Put God first always. Don't idolize anything ever. Your entire life from the moment of birth to the moment of death. In other words, be perfect. That's what perfection looks like. Do all of that and you will achieve God's glory and heaven. Fall short of that and you sin. 
Romans 3 says we all sin. We all fall short. We all break God's law. 1 John 3, 4 says everybody who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is breaking God's perfect moral law even once. 1 John 3, 4 says, I know him, uh, whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which Jesus walked. Do you know anybody that does this perfectly? No? Well, neither do I. I sure don't. I don't love Jesus the way I ought to, the way I want to. So these are the charges. We all sin. We all fall short of God's perfect standard. Nobody's perfect. We're all in the same boat. And from heaven's perspective, nobody is better than anybody else. Now let's talk about the sentence. That's part of every courtroom drama. And there is maximum sentences for every charge. Sometimes it's a fine or probation or community service or jail time, two years, five, 10, 15, 25 years, or some combination of all of, all of those. And of course, any sentence usually gets sliced down the middle and they end up serving half of that. That's the way our court system works. The point of the sentence is to satisfy justice. Punishment ought to fit the crime or the time. That's justice. We all want justice. Commit the crime, pay the fine, or do the time. That's a cry for justice. Justice is under the microscope right now in Britain because of that guy last week who killed some people on the London Bridge because he was a convicted terrorist who has been released a year ago after serving only half of his sentence. And so now people are crying out for justice. Justice was not served because we want the punishment to fit the crime built into every one of our psyche. And a lot of people in that case feel that justice wasn't served. Nobody would want a judge on the bench who is corrupt, crooked, and doesn't uphold justice. Except that we don't like God's justice. God is a holy, perfectly just God who must punish sin. Just as surely as we demand justice when evil is committed in our midst. And the Bible says that sin is cosmic treason and it is a capital offense against a holy God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. See, sin is only meaningful in relation to the holiness of God. It doesn't mean anything if God is not injected into the picture. The charges of sin are as serious as they come in this divine courtroom. Now let's talk about the prosecutor. There's a prosecutor in every courtroom. He's the guy who reads out the charges. He goes for the maximum penalty. The prosecutor is your enemy. He shows no mercy. He's the guy who's coming after you. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 10, that Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Satan means adversary. He's your prosecutor. He's coming for you. He is against you. He brings all of these charges against us before the judge. And he whispers them into your ear and he dramatizes them in your nightmares. And John calls him in this little book the evil one. He's the tempter. He hates you. He is always for leading you towards evil, to get you to commit evil, evil intentions and evil actions, and speak evil words. Everything God is for, he is against. God is for creation. He is for destruction. God is the source of life. He cultivates a culture of death. God is for unity, harmony, forgiveness, and reconciliation. He is for conflict and fighting and hate and bitterness and division. Satan is a powerful, 
evil, corrupt prosecutor. And he wrestles with you inside of your head. He can get into your head. And he can tell you that you're done. You're going down. And you're guilty. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And there is no hope for you. He gives man feelings of self-doubt and self-loathing and self-destruction. And it never ends. It's relentless. And the more you believe it, the worse it gets. And the more angry that you get, the more of a beachhead he gets in your mind. That's why 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, Take every thought into captivity. You either believe God, believe God's word, or you believe Satan. So we talked about the accused, the charges, the sentence, the prosecutor. And this sure sounds like we're in trouble. If you were in an interview room in a police station and a detective tells you, that you're under arrest, tells you the charges, tells you what the maximum sentences are for those charges, tells you that you're going to be going on trial and that a powerful prosecutor with supernatural powers is going to try your case. This is where you say, I need a lawyer. So let's talk about your defense lawyer. Back to chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And you can imagine John's reader saying, but we do sin. Who doesn't sin? Everybody sins. Nobody's perfect. But then John goes on. But if anybody does sin, I am so glad that John said that. Because we do sin. All of us. We all have tainted motives. We're all flawed. We're all inconsistent. We're all self-protective. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate. We have a defense lawyer. And he's on call. He's on retainer. He's always available. He's closer than a phone call away. He's never on vacation. He's never too busy. He's always with another client, but he always is able to take your call. Jesus said in John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I am with you always. We have a defense lawyer. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's why Jesus was born. He was born to become a lawyer. You ever hear the expression, lawyers are made, not born? Jesus is the only supernaturally born lawyer in history. There's lawyers in heaven, but only one practicing. And he's never lost a case. John said... The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There's a lot of lawyer jokes because lawyers get a bad reputation. Nobody knows that better than a lawyer. What's the difference between a good lawyer and a bad lawyer? A bad lawyer lets a, a case drive on for years. A good lawyer knows how to make it last even longer. <laughs> What's the difference between a car and a lawyer? One's an ugly, bottom-feeding, blood-sucking vampire, and the other is a fish. Well, apologies to any lawyers who may be here this morning. But lawyers have big shoulders, and they know all the best lawyer jokes. John writes, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is a perfect lawyer. He's sinless. Uncorrupted by the system, unjaded. He knows the judge. He's with the Father, John says. He's not against the Father. The judge is his Father. If you ever need a lawyer, you want a lawyer who plays golf with a judge. The best lawyer you could ever get to represent you in court would be a lawyer who knows the judge. Even better, his Father is the judge. And he is with his father, John says. He's close to his father. He's on speaking terms with his father. And then verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word. Propitiation. That simply means he is the justice satisfier. In a court of law, justice needs to be satisfied. Propitiation simply means the satisfier of justice. 
Well, how do you satisfy justice? With a just punishment. If I drive my car into your car up in the parking lot, and I cause a lot of body damage to your car that's going to require a lot of body work, and I say to you, I'm so sorry, here's 50 bucks for your trouble. What would you think of that? Wouldn't be impressed, would you? Wouldn't be happy because the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Justice isn't satisfied. There's no propitiation. But if the repair bill is $5,000 and I give you $5,000 to fix the damage, that will satisfy justice. Hopefully, that's propitiation. God is holy and he is perfectly just and he must punish sin as surely as we demand justice when society is traumatized by an evil crime and the appropriate punishment for cosmic treason is God's wrath. Romans 1 says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And therein lies the divine dilemma. How does a loving, kind, holy God display mercy and justice at the same time? by pronouncing a death sentence and then serving the sentence himself. Romans 2 says God is both just and the justifier. Jesus came to save us really from God himself, from God's wrath. Jesus, the perfect sinless sacrifice, bore the Father's punishment at the cross as if he had committed every sin in human history while preserving his own perfect innocence so that God could look at us as if we had lived Jesus' life. And justice and mercy kissed in the person of Jesus at the cross. Jesus became our heat shield, protecting us from the blast of the Father's wrath. Our defense lawyer, our advocate, stood between us and the Father and not only defended us, but he took the blame, bore the shame, paid the penalty, and satisfied the Father's justice. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, John says. He not only defended us, but he took care of the sentence too. First John 3 says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. When we condemn ourselves, we can tell ourselves that the highest court in the universe knows every charge that's been leveled against us, and he declares us righteous. Now our time is gone. Let's look at one more feature of the courtroom, the judge. God the Father is the judge. Genesis 18.25 says, Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Some trials are trials by jury. This is a trial by judge. There is no jury, and we ought to be thankful for that. I wouldn't want to be judged by a jury of my peers. I wouldn't trust very many people to give me a fair trial. We prejudge, and we prejudge inconsistently. We play favorites, and there's people that we don't like, and we don't treat them all the same way. But I trust the judge of all the earth to do right. He loves me. He's wise. He's kind and benevolent and good. And I trust him with all the puzzles and all the mysteries of life that I can't resolve because I know he can. He forgives me. He gives me heaven because his son, my lawyer, asked him to. Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection makes available the offer of unconditional forgiveness, heaven, and power to follow Jesus from now till then. Matthew 1.21 says, Mary will bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's the meaning of Christmas. He's our Savior. He stood between us and our judge, our advocate, our defense attorney, our lawyer, and then he served our sentence, and here's the best part, he's free. 
Not even legal aid. There's no charge. There's no retainer. There's no saying back home. The English love the gospel because they can talk about it. The Welsh love the gospel because they can sing about it. The Irish love the gospel because they can fight over it. But the Scottish love the gospel because it's free. <laughs> All you have to do is to ask him to help you. Will you be my defense lawyer? Will you take the Father's wrath for me? I am sorry that I have offended God's holiness. Please forgive me. Give me heaven forever. To walk into the divine courtroom without a lawyer would be your worst nightmare. Time is gone, Zach. Come and lead us in one closing and we'll be done.